So I found your conversation with John Verveke. Very interesting. Um, you guys had a really good flow going there. And I felt that you have a very profound, very nuanced understanding of attachment. Um, you gave an example, for instance, about how hunger for a baby is perceived mm. as pain. You know, this very visceral experience of pain. And I just felt from other descriptions that you gave that you really understand attachment on an experiential level. Mm. And in academia, for instance, uh, you know, we sometimes get dissociated from those uh, more visceral experiences of how yeah. attachment works. And yeah. I think we can lose some of the intuition there around how, you know, these relational physiological mechanisms really work. Uh, so I loved uh, your conversation and I'm mm. looking forward to this. And mm. I wanted to just ask you if you could give a little background on who you are, uh, what your approach to therapy is, and then sure. we can dive into attachment. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, I, I think you're already drawing a, a, an important contrast in, in the dialogue around attachment theory. And that is that um, my entry point to it is as a clinician. And so I was always a little more interested in how it could be applied in, in the work as a therapist. Um, so I've been a therapist for my whole professional career. Um, my, um, my training has kind of moved from uh, family systems all the way to more classical psychoanalysis, um, kind of weaving them both together back into attachment, which seems to integrate um, our inner world with the outer dynamics that it's encountering and how the two kind of influence each other. Um, and also, um, the work of Heinz Kohut, who is an analyst, um, that, uh, kind of moved psychoanalysis more into a modern era of, um, subjectivity and, uh, and that kind of also, <laughs> It's a, it's a web here, but Jung is important in here. And then kind of a pragmatic application of some of his ideas would be Dick Schwartz's um, IFS model, Internal Family Systems. That's not much about myself. That's, uh, those are the thinkers <laughs> that have influenced me. Um, uh, you know, I, my life has been largely built around um, kind of accumulating uh, experience of being with others and and figuring out how relationships are healing, uh, and, uh, and learning that personally too, along the way, uh, there's a cliche that people become therapists to figure themselves out. And that's a hundred percent true for me. And so in the process, um, you know, I, I've come to view therapy as a, a mutually co-regulating, uh, journey where where both folks are there as humans and, and open to growth. Uh, feel free to ask questions. I, I just, that's a, that's a start. Yeah. 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 No, that's wonderful. And I like that you started with uh, the thinkers that influenced you. I like to call them uh, my intellectual parents, uh, hey, you know, certain, great. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, great. because it says a lot about you who inspired you and mm. what thinkers drew you to them. Uh, so I love that. And uh, that definitely resonates. Let's dive into attachment because I really think that you have very unique perspective on the web today. You know, there's a lot on attachment and attachment styles and um, it's, it's entering the lexicon, you know, the yes. common uh, parlance. Yes. But um, I think that often people either talk about it in a kind of superficial manner mm -hmm. or they don't really understand the deep roots of how we are built for connection. And Sue Johnson, I love that she says mm -hmm. that it's, mm -hmm. it's not sex and aggression that are the basic drives, but it's the drive for connection. So tell us a little bit about how you see attachment when you try to explain this whole world, this whole uh, you know, system. What is attachment in your eyes? Great. Well, that, that was a great introduction to it. I don't know. I feel like maybe you should explain it. <laughs> the, the Sue Johnson, I, I, I should mention, we talk about like sort of intellectual parents. Um, yeah. she's, she's, she's way up there for me. I remember going to see her Same. at a, a conference in DC and 
uh, I think this was like 2006 and um, I was a young therapist. I was about 30 and I walked out of there and I can, I can hit that point. And I saw Dick Schwartz that weekend for the first time too. Oh, wow. And my career just shifted uh, I bet. because what I heard her explain about attachment and she works with couples and she was paraphrasing Bowlby's work and Ainsworth, but making it come alive in a therapeutic context. It, everything I'd been learning and had been using from the psychoanalytic side of things suddenly became accessible and usable. And I think attachment theory, um, the, the gold mine that it is, I think, um, as a theory it, is that it, it has such powerful explanatory potential and it's very accessible. And I think that's why it's making its way into culture is that it, it, it organizes pretty easily and but that's also the danger with it is that I think without nuance, uh, you can use it just like you'd use the Meyer Briggs, Myers Briggs or a, an even sloppier personality test. I think when I, when I think about, uh, what, it, what is helpful about understanding attachment theory? Um, you know, I, I, I start with that baby in the crib metaphor of, um, kind of the, this real basic sense of what is it to be human? Uh, and what is, what does attachment kind of mean uh, for us as a species? Um, so in the example, it's a, a, a baby feels in their body. Um, they don't feel a concept. Um, they, they feel a sensation and the sensation is, is painful and hunger isn't emptiness. It's, it's a physical thing. And then, um, so then the next thing is they have to find a way to symbolize this internal experience outwardly uh, and, and in hopes of somebody being there that, um, that understands the signal and then can respond to it and soothe what is upset in the body and then have it return to a baseline of, um, uh, uh, of stimulation and regulation. Um, so those four steps, the feel it in the body, uh, find a way to symbolize it, be responded to, um, excuse me, and be soothed. Bless you. Those four steps are, are really, um, it just, that's all it takes to kind of understand the building blocks of, of feeling secure in relationships. And so the functional definition of an attachment is, uh, is the, the emotional physiological bond with another person, um, uh, that that allows uh, you to feel soothed and regulated and also allows you to go out into the world and take risks and take actions knowing that that person still exists. So um, a, an attachment could um, also be thought of as a really our primary survival instinct. Uh, I love um, how you put it, how Sue put it um, as... It's not a sex drive. It's not a death drive. It's not about aggression. It is ultimately we come out of the womb with, with kind of one basic drive and that is to connect. And that's the one that keeps us alive. Um, I like to, you know, right. Melanie, Melanie Klein talked about, uh, the good breast or the bad breast and what the baby experiences in this field. Winnicott talks about the field between, um, the mother and the infant as this play space. Um, these are wonderful concepts, but I, I think in attachment, we'd say, you know, the baby doesn't come out attaching to a breast. Um, the baby comes out attaching to a person and that person, right. if that person is not attaching back, um, then that baby is in a, a very threatened place. Um, because for years to come, your survival depends on the other person's body really being connected to the pain that you feel. Um, and that, that, that kind of co-regulation and communication between a caregiver and a child, it is vital, not only to safety and survival, but it's, it's, it's extremely vital to psychological development and to one sense of self and how we walk through the world, trusting or not trusting that relationships are there for us to use, um, when we need them. So th that's where I start. Beautiful. You know, I think that as humans, we are born prematurely. 
Right. We need that connection in order to survive. Right. Unlike other animals that, you know, just right. hop and skip right out of the womb, we're born in this fetal state. We're very vulnerable. And mm -hmm. for at least a year, but really for many, many years, mm -hmm. we are dependent on our attachment figures. Yeah. And I think that sometimes in, uh, you know, maybe it's evolutionary psychology, we like to kind of look at the animal kingdom mm -hmm. and monogamy uh, isn't, uh, mm -hmm. um, you know, a popular uh, strategy for most mammals. So mm. monogamy isn't for us either. You know, a lot of these kinds of uh, mm -hmm. explanations. And I think that what makes us uniquely human, the fact that we're born prematurely, and that really comes out of the fact that, um, you know, we're more developed cognitively. Mm -hmm. um, we're aware of our uh, existence. We're aware of ourselves. We're aware that we're going to die. Mm -hmm. uh, one day we're aware of the future. All of these things come together um, and make us human. And there's something about that connection uh, to another human being that makes all of that bearable. You know, it makes going through mm. the world less painful. And, you know, Sue has uh, this thing in her book, Love Sense. She talks about, um, I think it's a study that she did with Cone as well, where they put women in an fMRI machine. Are you aware of this one? Uh, I think so. Go hand. ahead. It's a good one. Yeah. Right. Yes. Right, right. So they're holding the hand of their partner or in another condition, the hand of a stranger or in yet another condition, uh, no hand holding whatsoever. And they're given this electric shock. And before the shock comes, there's like the signal, this, um, you know, signal that becomes associated with a threat. Mm -hmm. And what they showed is that the activation in the part of the brain that processes pain mm -hmm. is reduced when the woman is holding the hand of her partner, especially if the relationship is secure. Yeah. So what that says to me is that, you know, being in a very loving, secure attachment uh, relationship means that the world is a less painful place to you. Yeah, literally. You no, know, what do you, what do literally. you think about that? Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like we could do a, it would be a great service to the world to do a, a whole podcast on the research because, um, it, sure. It, it's not, it, 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 it's not complicated. I mean, it, it's just, um, it's pretty straightforward findings like that, uh, that, um, the regulatory effect of, uh, of the presence and the felt connection, uh, of somebody that you are, um, I mean, we say bonded with, I think functionally it's dependent on. And that's a kind of a scary mm -hmm. word in our culture, like that's right. somehow bad. Um, but yeah, that's what we mean by bond. We, we mean kind of successfully depending on somebody uh, uh, to to alleviate and regulate stress. Um, that, that's it. That's it. And, you know, uh, so I think if I'm remembering right, I mean, some hand is better than none. But it's not as right. powerful as one where there's a secure connection. Um, yeah, I, I think I think it brings up for me, um, you know, just uh, to help to help folks understand this. I, I find the secure base and safe haven concepts like particularly helpful. And this is um, John Bowlby who who developed this theory. Um, you know, he was a psychoanalyst. I mean, you, you, you probably know the story, but he was an analyst in, in I think, London. And um, the, the, the ethos of the time was very Freudian. And, and so it was thought that children were kind of closed systems that were just dealing with drives internally. And that um, essentially you weren't allowed as a parent to go into the hospital with your kid uh, when, you know, in the, in the 40s and 50s in Great Britain. And so you would drop your sick child at the door with a stranger. And um, Bowlby witnessed this and he saw children going through these patterns of protest and then shutting down and dissociation. They're in a room together and nobody's playing. 
everyone was just like kind of zoned out and he's kind of like you know this the emperor has no clothes this doesn't make sense like this is not a good and he he was rejected i mean he he had to deal with quite a bit of pushback um but what he started realizing is like no we're there's something here there's something about the parent relationship that is like pretty vital to the experience these kids are having i mean it seems so frustratingly obvious but it wasn't and for a lot of human history it it, it wasn't um and that we could go into maybe why that is he came up with this idea of like kids need to feel like when there's danger that there's an attachment figure with it in proximity and the, this issue of proximity is like really important so are they available to me are they going to respond to me and this is sue johnson are they emotionally engaged a r e uh, available responsive engaged and uh it, and if they are i can return i can be soothed also are they close enough that i can uh they're a secure base they're a base that i can launch from and go out knowing that they're there if i need them um and uh, and then while this is being kind of um integrated through the 60s 70s 80s into our thinking culturally about raising children. Even now we're still kind of trying to get our heads around it. Um, you know, we're starting to look at adult attachment and, and, uh, partnerships and how do these dynamics play out, uh, in our bonded relationships as adults. And it turns out it's, it's basically about the same, uh, that the, the attachment system is still functioning and we're still using it, um, quite a bit. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't think, uh, our unbonded single friends at, at different developmental stages, um, have, uh, like unfulfilled lives because they're not with somebody. Um, and, and so we have to be careful about that. But, um, the idea with the theory is optimally. If we can have that relational component to our regulation, that we could, um, we can achieve more fully, but you know, that can be controversial. Um, you could say, <laughs> um, you could say, well, if, if somebody can find a way to feel safe and supported, it doesn't have to be in a, a bonded relationship. And I think the, the evidence suggests that's pretty true that, um, lots of people reach potential and productivity uh, without being securely attached. Um, but they probably are getting a lot of regulation in order to do that kind of, um, uh, that work that's, that's contributive and um, innovative and creative. I think there is a certain space that we have to be able to occupy mentally. Um, I think the easiest way to do it uh, is to be in a community, um, where help is accessible. Anyway, I'm, I'm diverting right. a little bit, but your comment about monogamy, yeah, no, this is great. Your comment about monogamy, sparked it off. yeah, it is a, a really, um, it's an interesting one in the attachment EFT community. Um, and this, I think there's been progression on this, but, um, you know, I remember Sue saying this was probably a decade ago, like, you know, if she's, if she's really pushed she still believes monogamy is optimal. Uh, and you know, I, I tend not to get too committal in these things because I think as a clinician, it doesn't really serve me or my clients. Um, I, it, this sort of case by case experience is what matters. Um, but, um, there are benefits. There are clear benefits to, um, that sense of commitment, um, kind of putting putting parameters on things that then don't feel like they have to be constantly evaluated. So you, you brought a lot up there. First of all, you know, what you said about dependence, that we're often, uh, we often think of dependence as a dirty word, <laughs> you know, right. We're right. And dependence is the highest good. Um, and we, we think that the moment that we are relying on someone else, that means that we are weak. You know, we think yeah. that health, is being completely independent and self-sufficient. And that's the narrative. As you said, you know, with single 
people, with our single friends, I'm sure they're fulfilled and they're living their lives to the fullest. There is an element, though, that when you don't have that secure base, you don't have that safe haven, Mm -hmm. you don't have that very basic sense of security that there's someone out there who's got your back. Yeah. That that preoccupies you. You know, that loneliness uh-huh. um, yeah. can be <laughs> mm-hmm. can be difficult, I think. And I wouldn't say that if you're not in a monogamous relationship that you're uh, necessarily sad. But I do think but. that if you look at a whole human life, you know, we, mm-hmm. our 20s and our 30s um, are mm-hmm. not our entire lives. And there's long chapters um, where ha- having someone who's committed to you is, uh, I think, definitely an ideal. And I think also we, and I understand that, you know, as a therapist, you want to keep an open mind with all of your clients because people are going to come to you with all sorts of shades and shapes mm-hmm. of, uh, of life and circumstances. Mm-hmm. Um and definitely not to be quick to judge that you know what the solution is. But I, I do think of, of you know, all of this work and attachment really showing, really showing how um, monogamy, you know, just being with someone who truly knows you, um, that there's, there's a sense of fulfillment and growth there that isn't easily attainable otherwise. Sue does talk about this, that if we don't have that safe haven, that secure base, that person who's got our back um, in a place, you know, in a person mm-hmm. that we can call home, that sense of security is missing. And a lot mm-hmm. of times that can really keep us preoccupied on things like safety and security. And, mm-hmm. and even, you know, um, that can be re- redirected mm-hmm. to sense of self, you know, and We feel like we're lacking in Mm self-esteem, but it's just because we don't have that person, um, you know, loving us back. You know, someone who's looking at us and is loving what they see. And I think that sense of real security and who you are being worthy of love, uh, you know, in a monogamous relationship Mm -hmm. uh, at its best, I think Mm -hmm. it can give Mm -hmm. that to you. And Mm -hmm. then from there, the growth that comes because. I think that in our world, you know, we do talk about independence as the highest good. And we therefore think that our best selves is something that we can only attain when we're alone. And that somehow a relationship is going to stifle our growth or stifle our, you know, self-discovery. And I think that's something that I would want to change in the narrative because I think, and, you know, I heard you talk about this as well that through relationship, we really grow. When you have someone who is mirroring to you who you are, what your blind spots are, you know, you have someone to contend with as well. So there's a little friction there. And you have that secure base and you have that person who motivates you and you know you can always return to. And that really gives the the exploration and the creativity, you know, an extra oomph. So you have all of these things and I think that allows us to really develop ourselves. Uh, so what do you think about that, about growth through relationship? Yeah. Wow. I mean, there, there's, there's a lot here. So I want to I try and help organize this a little bit. Um, yeah. I think what we're doing in some ways is we're invoking a developmental context. And that uh, I really like your perspective that, you know, who we are, what we need. And I would, I would add kind of what, what, what are the goals and what is optimal, uh, at these different stages of our life all the way. And we, in attachment, it's grounded in like infant research and the the dyad of infant and parent. Uh, and then somewhere in adolescence, you know, we begin to shift. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's theory around this of like, at first the, the goal is survival, you know, until puberty. And then the attachment goals actually widen and it becomes the, the, the continuation of the species. And so in the first half of life, there are certain biological imperatives at play in this conversation that in the second half of life may not be quite as, um, 
motivating. They're not as operative. Um, so, you know, building a relationship around growth, I think it is a very, um, a, a safer way to maybe enter a, a, a long-term partnership um, because it, it, it it's privileging the other person and yourself in a way that is sustainable. You know, it doesn't put a cap on what growth means. Um, and it, in some ways it says, um, if we're not able to do that together, then we have to look at whether this relationship is serving us. Um, and that doesn't mean there's an excuse to get out, you know, but oh, I'll back up a little bit. Having a, a secure attachment. Look, if, if we're in our 20s and we're fortunate enough to to have our family still intact and around us and available, that counts. But as we go out and we're trying to then build horizontally uh, attachments that can be sustaining people we can go through life with. The idea of fulfillment as the goal, um, I, I don't know. I'm not sure what fulfillment, I think it looks different in your 40s and your 50s and your 60s and than it does in your 20s. Um, I think. Yep. And it looks different between two people, any given two people. So I I tend to, I think this can get mucked down a little bit when we start talking about like, what are the ideal scenarios? Because th those can look really different in different ways for different people. I think the idea with attachment is like, you use the word preoccupied, which is a, actually a, a a theoretical word. It's a word that's used by Ainsworth, a preoccupied attachment style. And, and to unpack that, it, and you said it really well, it's like, well, if I, if I am under-resourced and there isn't somebody in proximity to me that I can use consistently for help if I need it, again, if I need it, um, there is something so basic and primitive about the need for security that my brain and my processing is going to get dedicated to that. And I, I will be preoccupied in some ways with that. Uh, and that'll override other functions. So I won't be able to perform optimally in other ways. The, the alternative to that in an insecure situation is um, I am having preoccupation, but my way of dealing with it, and, and this isn't always choice, this is just what my system does based on earlier training, is I'm avoiding it and I'm spending energy to stay away from the cues in my body. I am, um, I am finding that I must compulsively stay away from this, this thing that's kind of yearning or looking all the time for how can I feel safe and who's going to be there for me. Um, I think what we can confuse culturally for with uh oh this person's very driven and very successful and um that underneath that there can be a kind of compulsivity that's happening that is actually a flight away from themselves um into tasking productivity into the creation of a self that may not really internally have a lot of structure to it um that's often a setup for decades later uh, you know, what we call a midlife crisis where, um, the sense of self is suddenly, um, experiencing how feeble it is as the, the ever onward accomplishment trajectory begins to come to an end or something happens that challenges it. And these strategies of avoidance and uh, either compulsive performance or caretaking of other people, um, they, they stop working and their function is no longer as F. So I, it's, that's a lot there, but uh, it begins to introduce the idea of like, well, what do we do? What, what do humans do when that's not available to them? When the, the relational strategy, the interpersonal strategy of regulation isn't available. Well, the baby in the crib still has all the data that's going on in their body. And so do we, if we're under stress or threat. Um, what do we do with the data is in many ways the, the underpinnings of understanding attachment. And it, it does get at cognitive processing, which is, you know, John Verveke and I had a, a nice conversation about that, that um, when all that stuff is signaling inside, um, 
your ability to use it, work with it, and transform it into action uh, it, it is in some ways what we, we then label as an attachment style. Like, I'll pause right. there. Do you want to interact with any of that? Yes, yes, I would. I would love to. So one of the things that I think can help people understand attachment styles better is to think of them as orientations. You know, we're not necessarily constantly in an That's anxious right. or an avoidant attachment style. And we could be secure most of the time, but then be completely dropped into an anxious attachment moment. Right. Um, so there is some fluidity in these things. A lot of fluidity. And it's best. Right, right. And it's best to think of them as strategies, which is what they are. That's and right. You know, as you were saying, with the data that I receive as a baby in terms of the attachment figures that I have available their mm -hmm. level of responsiveness, their level of consistency. You know, we take that in and we interpret that. We create our internal working models, right? That's These right. cognitive structures of understanding right. ourselves. Um, are we worthy of love mm -hmm. and understanding of others? You know, are others mm -hmm. uh, reliable? Mm -hmm. Are others dependable? Yeah. And those things really uh, translate into our attachment styles. Um, but again, we can have different attachment styles mm -hmm. at different points of our life mm -hmm. and different mm -hmm. relationships. Right. Um, but often I do see, um, you know, that even someone who's securely attached, they have a go to, uh, you know, mm -hmm. insecure style. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. And often, I mean, that's really that's really well stated. It, this is where the, the cultural sort of uh, what's your attachment style thing really irks me. Um, it, it's, yeah. it, 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 there, the, there's the definition of, um, of, of relational health and mental health, um, is not secure attachment. There are infinite scenarios where secure attachment doesn't serve you being in danger and nobody's available to you. I mean, it is one of the greatest things that we can do is to dissociate from our cues so that we can function. That is not pathological. Mm -hmm. That is adaptive. Right. That's adaptive. Right. And, and adaptiveness uh, means flexibility of strategy based on situation. And so, you know, it could be pretty agnostic about what is healthy or what is optimal. It's like, well, if you want to be technical, what's optimal is strict flexibility. And those of us, yeah. those you of know, us with trauma or that did not have um, any reference point for security, we, we do often lack flexibility. And, and we could look down, you know, through the DSM or, um, you know, through, through how we conceptualize psychopathology that we get the further we get on a scale of mental sickness we may be looking at or one way to say it is we're looking at rigidity of strategy we're looking at a lack of flexibility that somebody who is constantly avoiding and not tuning into their internal data um and cannot do it at all you know that person could be very dangerous um they, they aren't reading situation. They're not in touch with reality. Um, maybe what we consider to be even more dangerous are folks that um, are not reading external reality at all, but only referencing their internal data. I mean, we, we think of this as narcissism uh, and can go right. all the way to sociopathy or psychopathology. Uh, and uh, so the... Uh, the idea of flexibility, I think instead of strategy, we could also just say working model, you know, that, that we have yeah. different working models that, and this is Bowlby's idea was like, yeah, we, we get models of who we are and how the world responds to us. Um, and, and it, you know, identity thing, and even the definition of love, are we worthy of love? And I think, well, what is that? Like a baby doesn't know what love is. Like a, that, that's a concept and a vague one at best, even for adults. So it's what is responded to. That's it. It's like if, if, if I'm upset 
uh, if I have these organic experiences in me, how are they treated? Um, and it, just the idea that, well, they, they should be responded to gently and empathically. I mean, that's ideal. But there are times where they do need to be dismissed a bit or just not validated or gratified. Um, uh, they need to be uh, put in context. The world isn't going to just be empathic with us all the time. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to slip into like parenting a little bit here as an example. Yes, please. If a child is running towards the street, um, a parent doesn't pretend to be a therapist and sit there and say, well, what's it like as you're running towards the street? Uh, let, let, <laughs> let's get in touch with this. Um, in fact, what a parent does is they get loud and big and intense and scary. And why are they doing that? Well, the, the, their role is not to develop your identity in that moment. Their role is to provide safety and protection and to, to act as that alarm system and to make an impact. Uh, so I, I don't think this is as easy as sometimes we make it sound in the attachment world of that parenting is just about being in an empathic mirror of emotional experience. Um, being a parent is about being provisional first and foremost. Um, and I think we're trying to talk about, well, what is the formation of a, a cell and a healthy, flexible identity? How is a parent providing the the environment for that to happen and then we get into um, the idea of what's being responded to and what's not being responded to sorry very tangential what are you getting from that so you know one of the things that comes up for me is this idea of a good enough parent yeah. you know we don't need to be perfect mm -hmm. we don't need to be responsive a hundred percent of the time in a purely empathetic way, mm -hmm. you know, there are moments for mm -hmm. uh, discipline. There are moments for limits. Um, there are moments for challenging the child towards independence. Mm -hmm. And one mm -hmm. of the things um, this might interest you, um, one of my conversations with uh, Mario, uh, mm -hmm. Mario McAllister. Um, so we were talking about attachment parenting. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that he said, which I found really interesting, was that most attachment parenting today, as you know, you see it in a kind of social media mm -hmm. and popular culture, yeah. is only focusing on the safe haven. Yes. Um, yes. It's not focusing on the secure base. That's it. So this kind of gentle parenting. Yeah. yeah. That's it. <laughs> so so tell me what you think about this and how a parent should think of if they want to parent with attachment in mind, mm -hmm. how they need to balance between these safe haven and secure base functions. Yeah. Um, as a parent, I'll tell you, I don't know. Nobody knows. <laughs> well, I, yeah. I, I, I hate trying to play expert on parent. In fact, you know, when I started my career, when I started my career, <laughs> I was a child and family therapist and I worked mostly with families and kids and a lot of what I would do would be looking at what 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 does this kid need from parents and in their environment what kind of what kind of softness and what kind of toughness and um we would borrowing from like strategic family therapy it'd be like what's the narrative in this system about the problem is it hey this kid is doing bad behavior uh or is it this kid is is sick and struggling and um, usually we'd, we'd have systems that were making errors one way or the other. Very rarely was it balanced. And we'd kind of need to correct a little bit. So another way to say it is, do we have a family system that is overemphasizing safe haven? Uh, or uh, a lo doing it, you know, a little too much uh, secure base, which of course is insecure base. I love that. You know? I love um, that approach. And so, uh, you know, but when I think how to say, when I, and I'll come back to that, but once I had kids, I realized I was a total fraud and like, uh, that doing that, <laughs> I, that I, I, I really had no right to be giving advice on how to parent because it is extremely difficult. And what is extremely difficult is it is a, it is first and foremost, it is about regulating. How good are you at reading and regulating your own system? Because that's the thing you're going to be dealing with as your kid seeks to regulate their own and is looking at you to help them 
And when you're bonded with a child, your system is connected to theirs. So when they're activated, you're active. So then if that's the case and you're focused so much on safe haven, y- your attempt when they are going up is simply going to be to keep trying to bring them down. Um, if it's secure base, it's going to be essentially to ignore the cues uh, and to uh, try to just get them to self-regulate. Uh, there's a sort of like laissez-faire parenting that you could slip into there. Uh, they're going to, they, they've got to figure it out. Um, right. Right. Here's what I've learned. I, I gotta be careful about judging what, what is right and wrong in a given scenario. I think we get into, there are areas where we get into safety that now we're getting into places where we need, really do need to make judgments and be very clear about them. Um, but optimally, a parent that is looking to provide a combination of softness and consistency and solidness, um, it, you know, what I, what I invite them to work on is often themselves and to uh, get practice at, and sometimes it's with a therapist, hopefully it's with their partner as well. Parenting, when you're, when you're, uh, partnership feels secure and you can do the co-regulation together, parenting is much easier uh, because you have somebody that's helping you regulate uh, and then the child can feel that, that solidness. Um, I have some, had many couples and I've experienced this too, where if you're not functioning very well as a team, it can actually be easier to not have the other parent there. Uh, and, you know, at least it's just me giving the messages. And we're not dealing with this uh, laterally together. Um, so I, I think, I, I don't know how many people listening are, are, are listening for the parenting piece and how many are listening for the adult attachment partnership piece. I think both are, are very fascinating. Um, I, I, agree. I, I, agree. I do want to make a point though, that we can get into a real reductionist space that because there is correlation with your attachment strategies when you're young with your attachment strategies when you're older in relationships, high correlation, um, that somehow it's a, a life sentence that, that you're going to be avoidant and, and that can't change. And um, I think the good news here is that that is totally not true, that um, there is a lot of plasticity and at different developmental stages, different things come online. Uh, and, and your toolbox gets bigger. Um, but it is a matter, uh, the, the training and the work that needs to be done to, ch- to grow and to expand and to lean into secure strategies. If you don't have them naturally, um, it is essentially relational work. It's not, you can't really do it reading a book. You could understand this stuff extremely well. You could be a professor that teaches this stuff. And it, it, it won't translate down to the body. Uh, you, can't, you can't learn how to swing a golf club well or consistently by becoming, uh, you know, writing papers about it. Um, you, it's muscle memory. And so in a lot of ways, psychotherapy um, is kind of the, the laboratory for this, or it can be. And so, um, you know, my experience helping people is that being in the room and being in the moment and attuning to data that's happening is it's like very much like physical therapy, just working with a group of muscles that need strengthening. Um, and it also involves the therapist being able to do that work too, just like the parent with the child. Um, I have to be able to listen to what's going on in me because it is inevitably connected to what's happening in them. Um, and together, uh, you know, we begin to build that and it, it it's just a quirk of being human uh, that 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 stuff has to be learned in relationship. Now, uh, Mario might uh, and research might kind of challenge that a little bit now because there's interesting questions about well, can you invoke attachment images in the brain? Can can you can you bring in experiences of security just mentally without another person? And have that be regulating right. and effective for you. And my reading of it, um, which is uh, cursory, uh, 
I don't, I don't think of myself as an academic. I'm not, um, is that it's a little mixed still like it, it, um, it kind of works for anxious folks, people that are a little more preoccupied and, uh, on that anxious strategy and they're in touch with their cues and their scanning and all that stuff that invoking a secure attachment figure in their mind, um, much like in cognitive therapy, we like try to replace a negative thought with a, a more adaptive, positive thought, um, that it has some effect on calming and regulating. If it's practiced and continued and, and rehearsed, but I, I think, I think it's less effective with, with avoidance folks. Interesting. That they, uh, uh, th there aren't really muscles there for feeling it. So you, you invoke Mr. Rogers in your head, who's would be great. I, uh, <laughs> and it, it, there isn't really a pathway for that to, to take hold. Um, and so somebody with an avoidant style really needs help slowing down and connecting to their body. Um, and unless they're particularly aware and determined to do that, um, it, 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 it's not likely to happen. Um, and, and to right. an extreme, those folks don't even seek therapy because it doesn't, either it doesn't occur or it's very threatening to, um, the system is attempting to deal with stuff that's going to be very flooding. Uh, and so managing flooding is kind of in a way what this is about. Um, right. Yeah. Right. I'm alone. I'm in danger. I don't know what to do. Um, if there's no real solution to those feelings, I mean, shit, you don't want to, you do not want to be stuck in those. Uh, and so th th there's a lot that's in the way for people that have depended on an avoidance strategy, um, there's a huge threat to a self fragmenting and being overwhelmed that has to be addressed Absolutely. slowly and patiently and with a lot of love and attainment and compassion. Absolutely. Yeah. I think that the you know process of going through therapy, uh, whether it's individual therapy or couples therapy or group, that experiential or group or group therapy. Absolutely. Gr gr absolutely. Group is like one of the most efficient ways to deal with this and, and a hundred percent and couples work. When you have other folks in the room, that's where you have opportunity to really get the attachment system going and to do the work. Um, if it's just you and your therapist, absolutely. you do have somebody in the room. And you can do that. But if you have the actual attachment figure there, it's like you got everything. It's all right there. So I, I'm sorry, I'm taking this yes, opportunity yes. to make a plug. Um, <laughs> here, Please if do. You, if you had a choice between going to individual psychotherapy and going to therapy with your partner and you only had limited time and limited money, and you had to make a choice about what you invest in. I would say your own personal growth is, is significantly more likely to happen by investing in the couple's work. Because all the material will be there. Like in the first session, you can't hide from it. And, it, and if a skilled therapist is there with you, uh, it, it's efficient. It's extremely efficient. I love that. I love that. And I agree. I think that the experience that you can have in couples therapy for people who haven't experienced very emotional conversations where you're being vulnerable with each other and you're really connecting and you're really understanding mm -hmm. what the other person needs mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then they're seeing you and understanding yeah. what you need and yeah. and that experience that visceral experience of being seen being heard being approved of I think that without that, it's it's very hard to uh, create lasting bonds. And mm. I think that without that, it's hard to get over conflicts because conflicts come up in relationships all the time. Mm -hmm. And really, I see them as bids for connection. You know, whenever someone's angry or frustrated, really underneath that, it's you didn't see me. Um, yeah. You know, you. Well, yeah. Like, and and we when we have these um, you know what we call secondary emotions. It's easy to access anger 
um, and, uh, you know, indignation. Mm -hmm. uh, but really at the base of that, a lot of times it's fear, fear. of rejection, yeah. fear of being alone. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it's, uh, mm -hmm. it's this pain. Uh, yeah, and it's pain, right. I think that if we, right, and if we don't get to the bottom of that, you know, with our partner yeah. and understand, you know, when they're being an asshole, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what fear or pain is at the base of that? Because it's hard to be em empathetic to someone who's angry at you, but it's much easier to be empathetic towards someone who's afraid of losing you and is losing his shit <laughs> because <laughs> oh, in his own unique uh -huh. way, uh, you know, idiosyncratic way. But really, uh -huh. um, I think I think that that's the that's the goal. And uh, if yeah. you do that in couples therapy yeah. and experience how how that can look. Uh, in a different way. I think that's very helpful for people. You sound like you're speaking from experience. <laughs> oh, 100%. <laughs> so, I mean, I was just, I, I, Rony, that's great. I mean, you're, you're articulating EFT, um, you know, again, Sue Johnson's emotion focused couples therapy, um, which is a lot of the, I mean, it's the, it's kind of the root of what I do, whether there's a couple in the room or an individual in the room. And, you, you're talking about secondary and primary affect. I would just add one of the ways I talk about it is like smoke and fire. That, um, yeah. that when you see if you're in a conflict and you see uh, you know, the other person being an asshole, you're, you're seeing anger, you're seeing defensiveness, you're seeing um, the smoke. But, and, and we begin to interact with the smoke. And the other person, like, it, it, you know, if you think, okay, there's a fire beneath this that they don't know how to show, and therefore I don't know how to see. Um, and we're going to get in this cycle, in this dance, where actually we're both interacting with smoke. And um, to drop down into primary and to address fire to fire, this kind of connection, uh, is the goal of a, a, of emotion focused therapy um it is beneath every conflict every fight it, no matter how trivial has these primary fears in them and um they are always fear and it is always embodied uh it is felt in the chest it is felt deep in the gut it is so compelling you can't just control it but if you have somebody um, if you have a avoidant relationship to your body, you pop up into your brain and the other person can't feel yeah. you or find you. Um, mm -hmm. and often you'll basically sound like you're discounting whatever's going on for them. Uh, and you're not respond. You're not ARE. You don't feel available to your partner. Yeah. You're certainly not responding to their emotions. You're not even, emo you're not emotionally engaged. And what that does is trigger the fire in the other person of, I, I don't matter to you. Um, you don't see me or care about me. My needs aren't going to be responded to. And if you want to understand like what that does, you just have to s realize, think about that in the unconscious world inside of you, just below the surface, there's no time. Time doesn't exist. So when you're in that state, you feel as if you're going to be in that state forever. And that's just fucking like intolerable to think I'm going to be in a relationship with somebody who does not see me, care about me or respond to me forever. So the terror is this can't work for me. And the reaction to that is one of two things and only really, well, I guess there are four things, you know, fight, flight, freeze or fawn. And right, these right. basic strategies are. I will fight for you to see me. Why am I doing that? I'm not doing it because you're an asshole. Although it's going to look like I'm telling you that. You are being an asshole. But I'm not doing that because you're an <laughs> asshole. I'm, I'm doing that because this relationship matters more than anything else in the world to me. And the idea of being in it in, and not feeling safe or loved is intolerable. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do everything, including rub your nose and whatever you're doing to try to get you to see me and to fight for it. But the other person's not going to be like, oh, I matter so much for you that you're going to list 10 ways in which I'm an ass. Well, thank you. That's so great. <laughs> they're they're going to, that's going to go straight down into their fear. 
And usually for that partner that's going up, the deep fear is I'm a failure. I will never do this right. And this person will, if that's true and time doesn't exist, I, I will not be loved. I will not perform. Here's a compulsive performance caretaking thing. Mm -hmm. If it's never going to get it right, this person's never going to stay with me. And so you have attachment terror of abandonment and being left alone. I had a client the other day say, I, I'm going to be an alley cat. That if I don't show up the way he needs me to show up, I will be an alley cat on my own. And that's what's underneath fights. And that's what we try and help people access and talk about. And it is like conversion experiences. I cannot emphasize this enough. Something neurologically and physiologically novel is experienced. And it is as if something opens about possibility of feeling safe at a new level that is sustainable. And remember at that deep level, there isn't time. It works the other way too. Oh my God, I'm seen. I am loved. I am responded to. I do. I mean, I feel tears as I say it. It's like, what if I can live this way forever? That, that changes lives. I mean, it changes lives and it changes generations. Um, powerful time where you are right now. Absolutely. And fear and trauma are being inhaled and internalized. And so people being able to be seen and responded to right now is vital and it will be vital for generations to come. And so the work I think that Absolutely. we do and the work you're doing here in this podcast it is extremely important. Because uh, secure attachment is insulating, like you brought up in that experiment about pain. It insulates us from the damage that trauma can do. And it heals us from the trauma that's happened. Trauma locks us in that state of fear where we are ultimately alone and nobody can help us. It's a good working definition of what trauma is in the body. Uh, so being found in that state by another person, whether it's a therapist or my God, even better, your part. Um, that, that's what we're trying to do. I mean, that, that's the nature of healing. Um, even if you, you know, the trauma work in our culture, right? I'm speaking of Western, you know, American culture, but, um, psychedelics coming into play, internal family systems going in and working with parts that are holding trauma. I mean, all of it is aimed at doing this, uh, going, retrieving parts in tremendous isolation and pain that feel completely powerless to get help and finding them and providing the, not providing the help, but pro providing the experience of not being alone. Uh, and it, 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 that's, that's it. That's what this is about. I love that. I love that. I could not agree more. And I think that, you know, at its best, um, a relationship, you know, an attachment of uh, someone really seeing you, uh, I, I think there's nothing more healing. And I think that we, um, that's right. We, I don't know if we've forgotten it or we're in that compulsive avoidant performative uh, kind of space but I think when once we remember to connect to ourselves to our emotions mm -hmm. um, to explore those traumas and understand where certain uh, very deep primal mm -hmm. fears come into play and communicating that with your partner mm -hmm. I think you're able to see conflicts in a different way right. and and you're able to connect um, in a completely a new way. That... Yeah. And you, your partner can go from an adversary or a threat yeah. of abandonment to an ally in your own emotional regulation and an ally in your life and your growth. And you could get to be that for them, which is just as enriching. Um, I think we should take a moment and just 
say, uh, you know, um, I don't think we've forgotten. Somebody said, this is not me. And I suppose you could debate it, but that uh, all of this goes back to war. All of it. And the loss of attachment figures is, is extremely uh, wounding and destabilizing. And it is felt generationally. So you could say we've forgotten. Um, you could say it's gotten lost in family systems over time. Um, but when you're in war and you're faced with death and no solution to staying safe, there is nothing adaptive about feeling that. What is adaptive is not being paralyzed and going on and living. But that requires some emotional gymnastics. And once you've found a way to cut all that off, uh, you're, you're relationally kind of handicapped and your children will not have somebody that can be in their body and attuned to them. It takes generations to heal. And, and even then it takes good fortune and resources to do that. And often addiction, um, trauma just creates an incredibly fertile ground for addiction. For, see, for soothing these things, these bodily sensations uh, consistently and effectively without having to take relational risk of more abandonment. Um, this is why 12-step programs are so successful. Uh, they provide, in my opinion, they don't just provide uh, connection to a higher power, they provide connection to other people's suffering and you're not alone. So... Have we forgot? Depends. Some of us never, some of us have never known. But the thing is, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. the thing is, it, it's still, even for people who for generations have not experienced a, a consistent, kind, res accurate responsiveness. What's amazing is because this is an evolutionary function of survival, the desire for it persists. It's just incredible. Like, there's still a map inside of somebody that is saying, here's true north, but I have no idea how to get there. Right. Uh, so th that, that desire, that drive uh, can still be worked with, even if there's no resourcing, you know, back three, four generations. Right. Um, but finding access to that kind of care and treatment isn't so easy. Um, so addiction, I think addiction often, if people are fortunate, it does deliver people to a program that's free, accessible, and works, and it's an attachment milieu. Um, so I've, I'm careful to not condemn the parts of us that are firefighters. And IFS, we'd say these are like extreme parts that regulate us like, uh, you, like addictions. Um, they're there to just put out the fire that your attachment system is experiencing. That they're parts of us right. that save us in many ways. They deliver us until they don't. And then if we're fortunate, they deliver us to a place where in brokenness, um, we can finally allow ourselves to be attended to because we have very little choice. At that. So there are millions and millions of those experiences. And um, I think there are versions of those experiences available in our partnerships. Um, yeah, no, sorry, that's all over the place. But how's that landing for no, you? No, I love it. I love it. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to, to talk about is the intergenerational yeah. component that you're bringing up, yeah. because I think that, you know, uh, as we know, uh, mothers who were mothered by an avoidant mother mm -hmm. or an anxious mother, um, they often continue those patterns on, mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily, obviously, but, right. um, we, d we do see that. And war, um, you know, and grief and trauma mm -hmm. can really impact, you know, entire communities, entire generations. And I think one of the things that I like to see um, these days when people are talking about healing uh, intergenerational traumas and writing a new script, you know, mm -hmm. for the lives of their children. Uh, 
we don't get it all right, obviously, but having that goal in mind of doing things a little differently. And that starts with ourselves. Yeah. Uh, you know, yes. to be a good parent, you need to regulate yourself, obviously, and you yes. need to heal your broken parts. Yes, that's it. That's um, the disruption of the cycle. Exactly. Exactly. And I think that's definitely necessary in places of war. And, you know, I'll just, um, I'll just uh, mention, you know, because uh, you were bringing it up uh, with everything that's happened here um, since October 7th. One of the things that's hit me hardest is that all of a sudden I understand grief. I didn't understand grief before I was married, you know, before I had um, a person who was my attachment figure, my bond, you know, my my person that I'll that I see myself living the rest of my life with. All that of a you sudden, ev- on. yeah, that, that I depend on and that I I can't I can't imagine living without. And all of a sudden, um, you know, being confronted <laughs> with the um, with the possibility that something might happen to either of us, um, and hearing all of the names of you know people who didn't make it, um, whether it was on October seventh or since then during the war, uh, you know, fallen soldiers, it hits differently. It hits differently. Um, you know, I, you know, when you're younger, you can dissociate, but um, now I think a real grief um, kind of sweeps over because I, I understand uh, where I would be if I were in their shoes. Um, and I think understanding that, um, you know, I, I would want people who are in those kinds of places, whether it's grief, whether it's trauma. Uh, I know that the only solution here is to, to heal uh, these wounds uh, for ourselves and for mm-hmm. the next generation. Mm-hmm. Um, so this is important work. And I think at its best, yeah. you know, when we talk about these things and understand that um, mm. we need each other, um, we can't do it all alo- alone. Um, mm. I think, and it's a vulnerable place to be also because you're not only dependent on yourself, you know, that's another scary thing. Yeah. Yes. Well, thank you for, for, for being open and vulnerable like that. And I, I think that what comes up for me is that you've articulated the risk of attaching Yeah. and that there is nothing. And, and this happens in having children almost in a more profound way. I mean, the, the short, I, I think because of the biological imperative to, to keep the species going and, and to raise a, a generation that will succeed and, and continue, that the threat of being bonded is, is tremendous pain. Uh, and even in couples where they're having fights about the toilet seat, yeah. What's underneath that is the fear of that pain, or the pain of loss of a person leaving. Yeah. So you saying I'm experiencing in my body the potential of grief in a way that I didn't know before makes complete sense. Yeah. Um, and I think it could be hard. I think most people, and I think you, my guess is you'd agree, it's worth it um, because of the richness of life when you're living with somebody and you have that kind of security. Uh, it's nothing that we would trade usually. Um, but if you don't know that security, if you don't really know it exists, even though there's a natural longing for it, um, the commitment to it, if perhaps it's not real, is terrifying. Uh, and so, you know, the parts of us that keep us from getting fully attached, the parts of us that um, are, are a foot on the brake or guarded, like they're not to be shamed. I just, I have to be, for anyone listening who, you know, is idealizing secure attachment as like uh, this thing that they have to get to that they can't or they failed or um, like the, the, the path forward is not to neutralize parts that are protecting us. Um, it, it's actually to embrace them as a parent would embrace a child 
and to appreciate what they're doing, um, to appreciate that the risks are very real. And then even if a part is sort of stuck in the past, it's stuck there because the risks were very real and uh, they haven't learned to flex and adapt with time. And so um, it, it is love and compassion ultimately that moves a system, an internal system uh, towards healing and health. Uh, Carl Rogers, who is the uh, you know, famous uh, father of uh, person-centered psychology, um, said that our psyche is kind of like a potato in the basement. And that mm -hmm. as, uh, as it sprouts, that the sprouts naturally move towards wherever the light is, the window in the basement. And I think there's something about even the, the deepest protectors in us will move towards a uh, loving responsiveness if they're given the opportunity to. That's beautiful, Seth. I think that's a mm -hmm. wonderful place to stop. There's so many more things that I want to ask you and, uh, Hopefully we can do another session on internal family systems. Yeah. I had a bunch of questions on that, uh, but this yeah, seems like that. such a wonderful note uh, to end on. Mm -hmm. um, I have, yeah, I have a ton of questions. So thank you so much. This has been so wonderful. I think that your perspective is really unique and it's important and mm -hmm. you really, really get into the root of attachment. And I, you know, always love to talk about attachment, but this was really, really wonderful. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, mm. uh, so we can talk about, um, IFS, uh, next time. And I know that mm -hmm. we're both, uh, young fans, uh, so mm -hmm. we can nerd out, mm -hmm. <laughs> nerd out yeah, on some love uh, that. Jungian topics. I Wonderful. love that. Yeah. Thank you, Roni. Um, I would, I would love to do part two whenever you'd like. And, um, yeah, I really enjoyed this conversation. Enjoyed your questions. I feel like you're a real partner in the dialogue. So thank you. Thank you, Seth.